Welcome to the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast. Over 90% of today's home buyers start their buyer journey online. Here we talk with not only industry experts, but also your fellow home builder marketers to learn how you can succeed in our incredibly competitive digital world. And now, here are your hosts, Greg Bray and Kevin Weitzel. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast. I'm Greg Bray with Blue Tangerine. And I'm Kevin Weitzel with Zonda Livable. And we are excited today to have joining us on the show, Dia Bondi. Dia is an author and a leadership communications coach. Welcome. Thanks for being with us today. So glad to be here. Thank you. Well, Dia, I think we need to start by just getting to know who you are a little bit. Give us that quick introduction for folks who haven't had a chance to meet you yet. Sure. I am a longtime leadership communications coach working with venture-backed founders and senior executives to help them speak powerfully at really critical moments and use their voice as a leadership tool. A handful of years ago, I went to auctioneering school during a sabbatical for fun and started doing as an impact hobby, fundraising auctioneering for women-led nonprofits and nonprofits benefiting women and girls. And it turns out what I learned in the auctioneering stage is very useful in our life, careers, and businesses to think about how we can all ask for more and get it. And so that's the author side of my title. My book, Ask Like an Auctioneer, is coming out fall this year, 2023. I'm a mom. I've got a 13-year-old super athlete and a 16-year-old son who uh, likes to build robots and I'm married to my high school sweetheart and live in California. High school sweetheart. That's rare nowadays. I tell my kids, it's not a goal. It just happened. I don't know what to tell you. Like, yeah. This is either going to be the easiest or the toughest question you're going to answer today. And that is, please tell our audience something about you personally that has zero to do with work that they'll learn about on our podcast alone. Let's see. When I was a kid, well, friends wanted to be doctors, nurses, engineers, and teachers. I wanted to be a long haul truck driver. BJ McKay and the bear. Oh man, that's a reference. I'm not sure everybody's going to get. I didn't get it, but I'm going to roll right past it. Yeah, I had a fantasy of like being a lone woman on the road, driving coast to coast in my super shiny 18-wheeler. Chrome all over the place. Yeah, and then when I pull into like a Love's truck stop, I would like drop out of the cab and people would think I was going to be some, you know, beefy dude. But instead, I was basically Daisy Duke falling out of an 18-wheeler. That did not happen, but I do still have that spirit alive and well in me. I like to hit the road. I like to go out and adventure and and I like to kind of do things on my own terms. So in full disclosure to our audience, I had a chance to hear Dia speak at a conference um, a couple months back about some of this auctioneering stuff, and it was fascinating. So that's why we wanted to have you join us, because I think there's a lot of great insights that you've put together here. But let's kind of start with the background of what the heck does auctioneer have to do with anything in leadership coaching or communication? Sure. So to give a little context, you know, I'm active in the world of entrepreneurship and leadership and folks come to me because they need to tell a compelling story to an audience. And in order for me to help them do that in a voice that is aligned to who they are, I have to ask the question, what do you want from your audience, right? I mean, if there are marketers on this podcast right now, it's what you think of it as a CTA, but it's not just two words that go into a button. It's a request of the room, whether it's for time, attention, resources, headcount, engagement, participation, investment, whether it's angel funding or big VC money or whatever it might be. When I ask that question, I'm usually met with another question, which is, what do you think I can get? And for years, I was co-conspiring with my clients to sort of lowball themselves by answering that question. Great. What do you think you can get? And they'd say, well, I need 10 heads. I need a $100,000 budget, but they'll never go for it. I'll ask for 50. I'm pretty sure they're going to get it. And when they'd get it, they would congratulate themselves and I would congratulate them until I started auctioneering. And I saw that actually, when we go for a yes, when we only ask for what we're pretty sure we're going to get. We inadvertently lowball ourselves and we don't even know it. As an auctioneer, after 2022 20, auctions, doing my impact hobby, standing in front of the room, doing the bidding exercise, I realized we are unknowingly lowballing ourselves. Why? Because as an auctioneer, we don't go for a yes. We can't. That would be the equivalent of me asking for an opening bid of $100, having somebody put their paddle in the air and me instantly saying sold. We have to actually ask in order to get a no, because the no lets me know I've maximized the potential of that ask, and I never sell it for the number I get a no for. I always sell it for the number just below that. So I want everyone to go, ah, oh, flip that bit in their brains and say, ah, oh, when I get an instant yes, it means that there's probably something more I could have gotten and twist that feeling you get when you get and ask for a no 
from a feeling of anxiousness and rejection into a feeling of sort of pride and relief that that no has told you you've maximized the potential of the ask and that you're going to negotiate down to the maximum that you've asked for and the maximum they'll say yes to. And inevitably, it'll be more than it would have been had you just gone for a yes. Does that make sense? Totally. But it's also hard for people to kind of get their head around, right? What, when you first put this in front of somebody in a coaching situation, what kind of feedback do you get? Well, the first time I tested it in front of a room of 60 women at a meetup in Silicon Valley, these are all like product leaders, finance people, early and mid-career leaders in tech, whether they're marketers or again, like in the finance practice, if they're doing product development, if they're copywriters, creatives, folks up and down functions inside of tech. My only job for them in that day, in the 20 minutes, I was going to share with them this idea of go for a no, no is great news. Stop going for a yes, and you'll get more every time. I asked them to do only one thing, which is at the end of my 20 minutes, tell me if this is crap or not. This is five years ago, maybe now. Every woman in the room raised her hand and said, please keep going. This is not garbage. And so we were off to the races. Yes, this is difficult for folks to do. Why? Because everything that lives between a guaranteed yes or a mostly guaranteed yes and that menacing word no exists in a zone I like to call the zone of freaking out. It's that moment when maybe marketers listening right now, maybe you've been in freelance for a long time, and what do you do? You try to raise your rates and it feels like, well, I don't know if they'll say yes. And that feeling you get that I'm going to ask for 150 bucks an hour and my clients all know me at $85 an hour, that feeling you get, it's because that number is in the zone of freaking out. And that feeling keeps you out and away from asking for more. Sometimes we look at things though, and do we get sidetracked by how we value it versus how maybe the other side values it. And it's like, well, I would never pay that much for it. So therefore I can't ask for that much for it. Where does that kind of fall in this thought process? Absolutely. I don't talk about it in this language in the book, but it's basically shopping from your own wallet. And you can't do that because what you value and what they value may not be the same thing. In fact, what you value doesn't really matter. What matters is how do we use the ask to see what they value? So let me get this straight. I should ask for more that I know I'm going to get a no to so I can step it back. Because currently right now, Greg is paying me $0 an hour to be on this podcast. Zero, Dia. Zero. And if you ask me for zero, you will get it. Oh, well, that's what I got. I got a yes on zero. So, well, Kevin, yes, that's correct. Here's the thing, though. There's a really good chance that if you ask, and it's not even a really good chance, like so many folks have told me, men and women have told me that they've asked for things they thought they were going to get an instant rejection for. And they got an instant, or in some cases, a little bit of a breadcrumbed, yes. And they're like, what? I asked for double my fee and I thought they were going to throw me out of the building. And they said, yes. What else have I been leaving on the table? Assuming that the thing I thought they were going to say no to was still in their ballpark. Yeah, let's put that to the test. Greg? Dude, I put it to the test for the last five years. That's why it's a book now, man. It is a book. But I'm going to do it live on this podcast. Greg, I want and I demand a five times multiplier of what I'm being paid right now. Well, I'm going to interrupt you right here. I'm not going to play <laughs> this game with you. You know why? Because you just said the word demand and an ask is not a demand. That's true. This is a subtle but very important distinction because when we conflate those two things yeah. and we assume that the ask has a demand inside of it, we end up sabotaging relationship. We see the conversation as transactional in a way that's not helpful. Sometimes seeing the conversation as transactional is helpful, but in that case, it is not. It is prioritizing your demand over the relationship that can enable a stronger, more powerful ask. It puts us in a position to feel like if we're asking for any of it, anything at all, it's a demand. Now for women, y'all sent me a few preview questions and there was a question in there about how women experience asking. Okay, I'm gonna go here for a second, all right? When we make an ask, that is outside of what we expect to get a yes for, it can feel like a demand to us and can feel like we're risking it all when we do it. And it feels dangerous. Hence freaking out, right? Hence, it's called the zone of freaking out. Exactly. And especially for women, there are probably women marketers listening to this pod right now, making a request that feels bigger than we're used to or bigger than we expect we might get a positive response for can sometimes feel like we're running up against, because we are, gender expectations. 
That is a behavior that is counter to what we're socialized in doing. We're prioritizing our need and asking, quote unquote, too much of the situation, even if our idea of too much is not even too much at all based on what our audience is perceiving. It's really important that we understand that making a big ask is not the same as making a demand. It's a request. Yeah, then again, kind of this idea that women have been socialized to not make some of these asks. Is that what I'm hearing you kind of imply? And I know that that's one of your goals is to help women do better in general. I mean, you want to help everybody, but. I don't want to help women do better. Women are already doing great. What I want them to do is have more resources and decision-making power so that they can influence and we can basically tear down the patriarchy (laughs) so that women can secure the resources they need. You know, single moms can bring the resources they need into their house to have economic security so that they can start businesses that they want to. You know, I don't use the word empower very much in the work that I do because women are already empowered. The question is, how do they actually garner the resources and decision-making they need in order to grow their agencies effectively, in order to get into decision-making positions that put them in a place where they can, oh, I don't know, advocate meaningfully for paid family leave in their organizations like that. So let's kind of try to bring this then toward the the audience we've got today. We've got kind of a couple of different directions we could go. Let's start maybe with the customer connection, right? So if we're in marketing and we're putting out these calls to action and things, what are maybe some examples or some opportunities to push for the no that we might not be thinking about in that scenario? Well, I love that question. I want to let everyone know in the room, I am not a marketer and this is not a marketing book. And the idea of Ask Like an Auctioneer is not necessarily meant to be applied to the marketing range, okay? Because I understand that you need to move people through your funnel. I understand that incremental yeses that move them toward the conversions that you want to have happen along the sales process are really, really critical. The components in this book that are really relevant there are, for example, maybe you're writing marketing copy. I'm not a copywriter again. Maybe you're doing digital campaigns. Maybe you're actually pitching creative ideas to your clients. What I want to focus on, think of it as selling the idea. I'm not interested in talking about act now buttons, okay? So when you're selling your ideas in real relationship, in IRL relationship, for marketers who might be listening to try to move their projects, their work, their sales down the funnel, we're going to focus very clearly on rapport building and storytelling as the setup for the ask. There's an idea that I learned from the world of auctioneering, which is inside every ask is an offer. That might just be a little different language than how marketers are used to thinking of it as like a benefit, right? Like what is the customer benefit? But I want you in a case to really think about what the offer is inside of the ask. Last week, I was at a writing retreat in Montana. There's a woman in the circle. She moved away from this career now, but spent many, many years in health and life sciences, big research projects, and had been writing grants for hundreds of millions of dollars in a single pitch deck. She didn't ask me, what are the words I should use to get a yes? What she instead was talking about, the greatest challenge was how do I make the person that's going to write me a check for $100 million feel like a hero. And that I think is really powerful. I know for me, when I'm live auctioneering, the first thing I need to understand is what is in it for my audience right here, right now? Are they bidding on art and they're going to feel like a collector for the very first time in their lives and part of an art community they've never accessed before? Are they going to go home tonight knowing that they advanced a particular social need in their community that's really close to their heart? Is this a place for them to participate in a collective act of generosity and feel part of a bigger wave of impact? In the things that you're doing in your marketing activities that require other people to say yes, this is where I would focus. That makes a lot of sense that we have to give them the story, right? You can't make any type of an ask without there being context, without there being a path, a clarity of what the vision is, right? Beyond just the fill this out or do this or buy this now. It's like, what am I getting? What's the context is the word I keep coming back to. It might not be the right word, but that story, I love the idea of keeping it about the story. And there's two layers. There's what are we here to do and what are we here to really do? You know, like maybe you as a philanthropist or as a granting organization, you are the one that's going to decide to write that $100 million check so that research can get done and children, you know, with a particular rare disease can move toward a cure. And maybe that feels good to you. But maybe what really matters is that you can brag at the cocktail table that you're the one that made it happen. 
in this industry, you know, we're helping people find their home. This is much more than walls and drywall and lumber and, and everything else, right? This is a place to create memories. It's a place to have experiences and a place to feel secure and safe from the world and retreat and all of that. And so sometimes we lose sight of that and being able to keep that story in front of people is a whole lot different than price per square foot. Right. Exactly. Am I buying a house or am I finding a, a sense of place? Am I getting a good interest rate or what I'm really getting is being able to afford to build community? Here's a little example. Last year, it was a year and a half ago, and you'll see that I have a TED talk that I, I share this small example. I wrote a proposal squarely in my Zofo and I eat my own dog food, right? Like I, I'm constantly going like, Dia, are you chickening out? What might garner a no? And not every ask you make in your career and in your business is one that is a Zofo ask, but when it really matters, like that, you know, consider it. We sent a proposal off. The woman that, that helps me with engagements and operations was like, Dia, stop wimping out. Like that's not going to get you to a no. So she made me add like another 30%. We send it off. I was totally sure I was going to get a no, but I was actually, even though I knew it was a Zofo, I could feel it in my body that it was a Zofo ask for me. I also knew because I had spent time really building rapport with this gentleman that we were about to head into a negotiation, understanding completely that negotiation and the ask, I think of them as two separate things. There's the ask and then there's the negotiation that happens after that. I really spent time feeling like I could trust the relationship so that when he came back to me and had to say, oh, we can't do that, ha ha ha, who do you think you are? That we could also stay in conversation. So that's what I mean by the storytelling that leads up to the ask. The relationship building you're doing is really critical to give you permission to go for that no. And I don't mean permission from them, but the strength of that rapport can help you step into your Zofo with a little more confidence. Just for those who didn't listen closely early, Zofo is a zone of freaking out. Yeah, which is a number or an amount that you're going to ask for that is bigger than what you are pretty sure you're going to get. Yeah. And you'll know when you're in your Zofo because you can feel it in your stomach. <laughs> yeah. So we're in that zone and we're uncomfortable, but often we feel like we only get one shot to kind of throw that out there. In, in an auction type environment, you get to move up and move up and move, and then you can kind of back off a little bit. But often we only get kind of one initial opportunity to kind of put the number on the table, so to speak, or whatever. But do you though? Well, we think we do maybe. There you go. I can't tell you how often I talk to folks in my workshops and keynotes who are like, you know, I thought it was a one shot and they came back to me two months later. And look, if it's a one shot and they're out of there, probably weren't a great match for you anyway. And I'm talking to the marketers in the room that are advancing their agencies, that are serving their audiences, that are helping make happy home builder client successful by doing the best creative they possibly can. You know, they're growing their agencies or their freelance business. I know that we're talking about construction and real estate sales, but there's an enormous amount of talent that goes into making it possible to sell one single home to one family, right? Think about all those flyers y'all designed, <laughs> all those funnels you created, all that creative and branding you did for that home builder, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of work that advances your own career, your own agency, your own team. I just want to challenge this idea that it's a last chance shot. And there's a pretty good chance that if marketers on this call pitched a client and they said no and just ghosted you, they were probably not going to be a great client for you anyhow. Fair enough. Fair enough. So let's spin to more of the career path. A lot of the marketers that work for builders directly tend to be you know, women in those marketing roles. And there are some challenges sometimes with women fighting against kind of that good old boy network a little sure. bit and dealing with some of those things. Where does that kind of fit in from a, a career management, a leadership kind of coaching scenario of some examples of how someone might apply these ideas? I don't think of it in a leadership capacity that much. When we start talking about leadership, I'm really getting more into my communication side. However, I have two clients right now. They're heading on out to do fundraising. And they're going to make some asks that are pretty intense. <laughs> they're going to say a hundred million instead of 60. And they're going to see what happens. Home builders have to go raise capital somehow, don't they? Looking for investors and trying to put together a coalition of investors to try to build important and big projects in the world. That is in that way, sort of an act of leadership, right? Because without those resources, the tens and thousands of people that might be behind them 
okay? I'm going to say behind them in the wake of those yeses and nos and those investments that create household incomes for construction workers, for folks who provide products for home building marketers, the whole ecosystem, right? So it is a leadership act. But in terms of career, I believe, and I see it all the way from how my daughter react to asking if she could sit in the back of the room where it's quieter during reading time, because it's hard for her to sit at her community table and concentrate to recent graduates trying to advocate for a strong salary, maybe a little bit of stock options in their very first role when the stakes feel really, really high to somebody taking on their first leadership role, having direct reports that I think that asking is one of the most overlooked and actively avoided success strategies out there. If we can learn to ask with more courage, also more heart, and not in the spirit of demands, but in the spirit of help me try to get where I'm trying to go, we can often accelerate toward those goals. Now, Kevin, I'm just visualizing here this idea that there's a whole bunch of VPs of marketing at Builders who need to ask for larger website development budgets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, and if you guys need some help figuring out what to use those budgets on, I know a guy. I, I know a guy. I'm, I'm literally, he's talking right now. So you, I know that guy. Importantly, when you marketers in this business ask for budget, whether you're an outside agency serving the home building domain or you're a, a home builder or developer trying to get work with a particular city or a county to get permits moved through or deal with variances. My dad had a small construction company, so I know what the word variance means, or to try to get something done that when you make the request of somebody who is your quote unquote point of contact for where the work that you're doing intersects with a larger team somewhere else, do not underestimate how difficult it might be for that person to go advocate for your ask to their senior people. I spend a lot of time helping people work through the hand wringing of making the bigger ask for themselves. And once they've made it, they're like, Phew. if we don't get responses sometimes from those people on the other side of the table, it's not necessarily because they're terrible or ignoring you is because you've just given them a challenge to go advocate for you to other people. And that could freak the hell out of them too. So we have to come at all of this with empathy and tools for people to be able to advocate for your ask to their stakeholders. Some great reminders, right? How do we help them succeed? How do we understand their dynamic and what's going on and be able to, to be part of the solution instead of just causing more problems? Great thought. Where does it fit in kind of the one-on-one -on -one sales type of conversation? So somebody walks into a sales center, they're talking to a salesperson about a home. Obviously, there's a lot of different parts and pieces that go into that as far as options and upgrades and interest rates and buy downs and financing and all of these types of things. And you want to put them in the right home, but you're also trying to maximize the value for the builder if you're their representative. How do you deal with a customer in sure. this type of uh, context? Sure. I have no idea, but I'm going to take okay. a shot. What do you think about this? <laughs> in my communications work and the years I've done this, like I am so agnostic to, to topics. I've worked in blockchain and fintech and health and life sciences. I've worked on global Olympics, social impact, like give me a topic. Let's talk about it. So I will try to use those muscles in answering this. I think for folks who are in that across the table conversation, it is important to go back to what we mentioned before. I don't want to add new ideas into this conversation. You need to understand what the offer is inside of the ask. Maybe they're asking for a custom wool carpet instead of the standard laminate flooring. Okay. So maybe the ask is for that practical thing, but you as the quote unquote seller need to be listening for what's the real need underneath that. Oh, you have four kiddos. You need a quieter house. It's not about, I want wool because I want to be fancy. I, I need a quieter house. And to be able to reflect that back to the folks across the table, because maybe that's outside of the scope of what you can say yes to at the price point they're operating at. I have no idea the cost of difference between putting wool carpet and 2,500 square foot house and doing laminate flooring. But I would imagine you add up all these little requests, we're tens, twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 outside of our scope of what's possible. Am I wrong? Wool carpet's expensive, mm -hmm. right? We'll go with yes on that. Okay, great. I love it. So what we're <laughs> listening for is, oh, we can't do that, but I hear you and wanting a quieter house. Let's talk about how we can get that need met. Because I can't do wall-to-wall -wall wool carpeting for that price, 
But if you can, as a salesperson, understand what they're asking for and what they're really asking for, you can also say no and still get their need met a different way. Because I understand for these sellers, I think of a seller as the agent in the office, but also the builder themselves. You need to move inventory, man, because getting that capital lets you go on to the next project, right? Can't have your capital locked up in these things sitting forever. So I hope that folks who are listening and doing that kind of selling, having conversations with young couples, families that are buying their first home for the first time, to really be listening deeply for what the real need is. And when you can build that kind of listening and trust with that listening, you're going to be able to have a little bit more fluid conversation moving between yeses and nos without it breaking that rapport. Now, isn't it fascinating that in order to get to an ask, you have to listen. Get out of here. You you have to stop talking, right? I think that's great. Again, it's communication, right? It's communication. It's understanding. It's empathy. It's looking for that deeper need underneath what they're really trying to solve. You weren't joking. We really are supposed to listen. Is that what you're saying? You are actually supposed to listen, but also having the courage to reflect back to the people that are talking to you and making connections that maybe even they don't see. They might say, I need wool carpet. And instead of saying why, because not everyone knows why they're asking, but they are driven to ask for it to say like, are wool carpets helpful to you? Cause they're kind of difficult to keep clean harder than a laminate floor. Is it sort of the quietness that it brings that might be useful to you? And if for them to go, yes, actually that's it. That's it. I know cleaning is a pain, but like, oh, can you imagine if we had such a quieter house? Cause it was carpeted. Do you see what I'm saying? Like you have to have the courage to listen closely enough to make connections maybe for them that they're not making even for themselves. Yeah, we really appreciate the time you've spent with us. I think this has been great. Tell us when's the book coming out and how do people get their hands on it? Thanks so much. You can go to asklikeanauctioneer.com. That's the home for the book. It's coming out November 14th, 2023. Whenever you're catching this podcast, you can order it though, even if you're listening to it before that date on your favorite bookseller online. And it's very meaningful to have you even request it in your local bookstore. If you're somebody who likes to hang out in bookstores, especially locally owned bookstores, it helps them out so much. If you can say, Hey, I'm looking for this book by Dia Bondi. Do you carry it? And if they don't, when you make that sale through that bookstore, it makes a huge huge difference. So you can go to asklikeanauctioneer.com. If you purchase the book, you're going to get other freebies and there's a lot of worksheets and other things that'll be downloadable once the book launches to help you put together a strategic ask for your own business or career to help you get you to your goals faster. Kevin loves the support local business movement. So he's, he's already scheduling it. I'm all about local business, brick and mortar. Yes. And I assume that can people still buy it on the evil empire? I'm not going to mention their name because they're evil. But can they buy it there as well, I assume? Absolutely. Yes. Available now on the evil empire. I just want to put something into practice because this is not a demand. But Greg, I'm currently at zero. And what would really make my life a lot better? And I'm just going to ask this out here. I'd like to see a 10 times multiplier on my current pay scale for the podcast. If it ever goes public, I'd like to have 20,000 shares. Greg, 10 times zero is still zero. So you're good. So Kevin, if I'm hearing what you're after is you're looking for ongoing validation that you're doing a great job. Yes. Great job. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. That. Cool. All right. Well, it works. <laughs> Dia knows what she's talking about. Dia, any last words of advice you wanted to leave with our audience today before we uh, wrap up? Uh, yeah, I would just say that price or what folks will do for you or give to you is a measure of what they value and how they value it not a way to determine or define your own worth or worthiness. Powerful. All right. Well, again, anybody wants to reach out and connect with you, best way for them to get in touch, asklikeanauctioneer.com. Or diabondi.com. Also, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. And my Instagram is at diabondia. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Dia, for spending time with us today. And thank you everybody for listening to the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast. I'm Greg Bray with Blue Tangerine. And I'm Kevin Weitzel with Zonda and Livable. Thank you for listening. To learn more about how Blue Tangerine and Zonda Livable can help you generate more qualified home buyer leads, visit bluetangerine.com and livable.com. That's L I V A B L.com. If you've enjoyed our show today, please tell a friend, leave us a review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Be sure to join us again on the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast.